Denise Pratt. Welcome to Air Table Talk Unplugged. It's a show produced by the communication section of the Ministry of Education, Technical and Vocational Training. Here we feature key education stakeholders as we discuss issues that are critical to the academic sector. Now a lot has happened to advance the quality of education, particularly since our country obtained independence in 1973. Today, I am speaking with former Prime Minister, the Right Honourable Perry Christie. Mr. Christie served as Prime Minister of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas from 2002 to 2007, and again from 2012 to 2017. Today, in honour of our country's 50th independence, I sat down with Mr. Christie and I asked him to share his thoughts on the major education initiatives that were launched or enhanced while he was the Prime Minister. I'm so thankful that you agreed to do this interview because I think it's important for, from a historical context, that we hear from our leaders, you know. Not much has been written. You haven't written a book yet, and we're looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. But for now, we'll take the oral history. So I'm gonna start with the first question. I'm gonna actually read a quote that you made during your first term. And it says, education, not money, is the cure for poverty. And likewise, education, not jail, is the solution to crime. I want you to tell us, what prompted this statement, sir? When I was elected first, I represented a constituency Senate bill that was very diverse. It had lots of people who were working class people, but virtually all aspiring to move up the ladder. And I had to become a part of that. And so I saw the impact of poverty, the impact of unemployment. And I wondered how did that influence education? Because in my own life, education became center and front for me. At a very early age, I passed an exam to go to the prestigious government high school. But I only lasted two years there. Wow. I was expelled and the judgment was for those of us who were expelled, that we could not make the academic standard. And really, some people are like that, and they should then seek an alternative, a trade, for example. Donald Davis, who was principal of the school, we call headmaster then, of the school that I passed from, told my parents I was smarter than that to send me back to that school. He put me in the hands of a couple of good teachers. I passed some BJCs. That becomes very important because the Ministry of Education, after yes. a great struggle, using the BJC yes. as the standard. I then had to go to work. I went to night school. The decision to go to night school was motivated by the fact that I had begun to understand how much I had embarrassed my mother and my father. Mm -hmm. I was the oldest child. They were so happy to see me pass an exam to go to high school and then to be expelled. I made a decision at a very early age that I could do better. How old were you? I was 14. Okay. I could do better. I should do better. Mm -hmm. And I dedicated myself to Everything that I did, I wanted to do the best I could. So I started track and field in a meaningful way. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, I became the second Bahamian to win a medal in international competition. Very Tommy good. Robinson was the first. Mm -hmm. I went to night school. And I remember my father, when I was going to take um, GCE's night school, he said, man, I'm sorry for you because you're taking them with your sister who's three years younger. <laughs> The results were magnificent for me. Excellent. So much so, I passed four or five of them, and the headmaster then of the same school I was expelled from reviewed my work and asked to see me. And he offered me a place back into the school, mm -hmm. saying that 
I ought not to have been expelled. Clearly, the evidence suggested, and then I confirmed it through the results. I told him I wasn't going to come back, um, but I was trying to persuade my father to sponsor me into England right. to do more O-levels and some A-levels to get into university. That happened. Yes. Um, I went to England, did some O and A-levels, got into university, had the distinction of winning the first year debating tournament at the university. Excellent. And then I discovered that I had a, a gift of a sort in public speaking. And so I became a debater, so to speak, at the university. And ultimately, the same gentleman um, who was the principal of the school that I was expelled from came to recruit teachers for the Bahamas government. And two of the people who applied for a job in the Bahamas came from my university. And when he asked them, do you know any Bahamians? They said yes, and they described me as then the president of the debating society, this and that and the other. And he says, oh, he I was know. my student. Yes, I and know. And so that was the ultimate, um, for me, achievement in being able to be a comeback kid, so to speak. What being, was the name of your university? The, Birmingham University. Birmingham University. So ultimately, I had that kind of career where the second chance and third chance became a part of my own history, okay? Yes. I, um, I like to pivot off that word, second chance. Yes. That term, third chance. Um, right now, we are dealing with the after effects of a pandemic. Right. And prior to that, there was Hurricane Dorian. So what occurred was a learning gap. You know, a lot happened during the pandemic that unbalanced the playing field for many people from an academic standpoint. We were looking at the Bahamas High School Diploma, and I do believe the Bahamas High School Diploma came forth under your administration. I know the foundation may have been let, um, placed there a bit earlier before your time, but it actually came forth during your administration. And one of the requirements is that you need four BJCs. What do you think of the high school diploma now compared to back then? Well, I I'm proud of it, you see, because when I um, had to go back to Eastern Senior School, we then took uh, BJCs. Mm -hmm. And um, I found that in taking them, my confidence in my own ability was restored mm -hmm. because I did well, I passed. And I suppose it was the first time I was really focusing mm -hmm. and using the terrible experience um, to promote and to drive me further. You see, and so um, the, the Bahamas went through a whole process of trying to determine um, what would be the uniform standard to, throughout our school system, both public and private sector. And for some 15 years, I believe, um, union executives and, and the officials of the Ministry of Education were struggling over what the criteria should be. And I thought the minister, Jerome Fitzgerald, um, who um, was exceptional, really, in some of the things he was sort of initiating um, coming out of a plan that we had prepared. Um, but he led a group that traveled to some of the countries that were well known for their educational system, All right, Australia, New Zealand, um, Finland, um, Singapore, um, Ontario, Canada. And together they came back because they found out that that these, in, these countries were using grade nine, okay, as the determining grade um, for the standard or the criteria to, to be set. And we were the only jurisdiction, as far as I was aware, as far as I'm aware, um, who had an exam after grade nine, the BJCs. Right. And so it was a natural evolution that it was determined that the BJCs would be the criteria we were looking for, and that in itself will enable the people who have the banks and people who employ um, to look and be able to have a standard um, to go by, universities and colleges mm -hmm. to have a standard to go by and being able to look at what has happened there. Quite frankly, um, this whole element of recognizing the vulnerable in our country. You talked about taking care of the vulnerable in society, especially when their parents or guardians are unable to 
do so themselves. Now your administration had a special focus on special education. And um, in 2015, you opened up the Marjorie Davis School for Special Education. Where did this come from, this focus come from? You know, I became Prime Minister of the Bahamas in 2002. When I became Prime Minister, I had a special child called Adam. Mm -hmm. I'd had the experience of going through denials as to autism, mm -hmm. trying to find all sorts of other reasons to describe what his challenges were. And I had to go through that process that all parents who are faced with um, disabled children go through. I even reached a point where I had to ask God, why do you create imperfect children? Who are you sending a message to? What is it for? Great levels of anxiety and frustration. And I had personally protected my family against the, the challenges of a special child by being Adam's protector and companion and sleeping with him. And, 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 and really, I reached a point where I had to rationalize that if I'm a person of faith, mm -hmm. I have to believe that God had a design in my becoming prime minister. Mm -hmm. And then God wanted me to do something about it since I had the power to do it. Mm -hmm. Once I arrived at that decision, I then commissioned a study and a, to analyze and see where we were. I even brought from Cuba some of their officials because I'd heard they had a dynamic program down there to look at what we were doing here. The cumulative evidence presented to me was that we were far behind in where we ought to be in dealing and uh, in, in having programs to deal with special children, to deal with preschool and, 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 and children, early childhood education. All of this yes. sort of came to bear on us. And, I, and new policies had to be evolved and, 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 and developed. And so I then, um, um, after those programs, I did a protocol with the government of Cuba to bring special education teachers to the Bahamas. That was a big breakthrough. I then began having training of public education um, teachers. Um, we reached a point where we then put them in the mainstream schools. And my, my Adam went to Gavin Times. And I would go to Gavin Times and watch this as prime minister and watch and watch. So this is the first time this that- This is the first time. Okay. That they were actually placed in mainstream schools. That's right. And okay. so it was, for me, it was opening up and opening up and opening up and giving this opportunity. And then one day I was in my car and I saw this lady walking with two young men and both appeared to be special. And I got off my car and I spoke to her and I realized the challenges. And I met another lady who said that the Ministry of Education gave her the opportunity to take her child because she couldn't leave the child home with no one there right. and put in an office, lock, in, lock her in an office until she finished her work and then would take her ho home. So all of that s accelerated my thinking on what the country had to do. And we kept on working at it because I went to Trinidad and made a speech at CARICOM and I was arguing that there was a fundamental right every child to participate in the equity of his country. I remember the Prime Minister then of Trinidad coming up to me and saying, I'm so happy that you talked about your child because I have a grandchild and I was always reluctant to speak publicly about him and you were so open. And that's one of the things that I realized I had to do too, mm -hmm. that people were uncertain as to how to present um, special children and adults in their families. And I wanted to be very open, and I tried to publicly 
the open, made Adam a star really. Everybody got to know that there was an Adam and yes. what he was doing. And I got to understand more and more the need, of the compelling urgency of the country to have policies, um, particularly policies that would be able to assist people who live in an environment that they cannot meet the cost of that environment. Right. And so philosophically, um, I was truly inspired, um, first by the fact that Bernadette and I had this child um, who right. was a loving child, and we understood then much more um, about the subject, and we went on to try our very best uh, to put the country. And finally, I, I dedicated 50 acres of land on Gladstone Road. I'd had Bruce LaFleur, the architect, draw comprehensive plans okay. for a place where um, that could exist where they could go and exercise, be taken care of. Parents who couldn't afford to keep them would have the buses take them there. All of that was a plan, but it was not followed up at, the, at this stage. And I hope that this current government is able to pick that up and do it. Yeah. Just like the, the, um, the, the act that, that was brought into effect, uh, early education. At the time we had that, mm -hmm. there was just nothing. There was no regulations, no law, no anything that's to govern That's the Early Childhood early, Care Act in 2004. Right. That is right. So tell us a little bit about that, because you're saying that prior to that, things were a lot different. Science at the time was telling us that children began their, their learning process mm -hmm. at a, a much earlier age than the primary schools, that we needed preschools. Pre-primary, yeah. Pre-primary, right? Mm -hmm. And, and so um, we, we uh, looked at it and we saw that we needed regulations, we needed mm -hmm. standards, we needed, you know, how do you go about preparing the right designs for it? Um, um, how do you have the, t the standards for teachers? Right. Um, everything. I want to turn over to higher education now. The College of the Bahamas, um, under your administration back in 2016, the College of the Bahamas transitioned into the University of Bahamas. And I want you to share with us a bit about the background to all of this, because I'm sure it was quite a process. Well, I deemed it an, a privilege, a God-given privilege for me to have gone to university. Mm -hmm. There's so many friends I have who didn't have that opportunity, but who are brilliant. The current Prime Minister is one, Hubert Ingram is one, Sean McQueenie, yes. extraordinary brilliance. The law. Mm -hmm. they, these men were all great accomplishments, but economic circumstances prevented them from doing that. But nevertheless, they overcame and excelled. Yes. In my case, I always felt, okay, that I had to work to make the College of the Bahamas a university. Yes. When I became prime minister, I called up Franklin Wilson, who was a member, a board, member of the board of directors of Elmira College in New York, mm -hmm. who had experience, therefore, of being a part of the administration of the university. Yes. And despite his initial objections, I said, you have to do this. God told me you must do this. <laughs> and he always laughs when I say that. But he actually agreed to do it. His deputy was Jerome Fitzgerald. So remember yeah. that. And then I gave them the direction as a prime minister, I would wish you to transition the College of the Bahamas into a university. When that, our term finished in 2007, we lost. We were about two, three years away from the university. When I came back to government in 2012, I had to choose now the leadership of the Ministry of Education. And I chose Jerome Fitzgerald. Okay. who was the deputy uh, when Wilson. I gave instructions. Right. And then I had the good fortune of having the former minister of education, Alfred Sears. I invited him to become chairman of the okay. college. And then I said, we must now transition in this term, okay, the University okay. of Bahamas. We must bring that in. And, 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 and they did. And, and the combination of, of Jerome Fitzgerald, Alfred Sears, the past work um, brought about the fulfillment of the University of the Bahamas. And I really, truly felt good about that. And I'll tell you why. Whenever I spoke at a university, either in the United States 
or in the Caribbean in particular. And I've, I've spoken at St. Augustine's in Trinidad, UWI in Jamaica, and University of Cayman um, in the Cayman Islands, University of Northern Caribbean University, Seventh day Adventist University in Mandeville, Jamaica. And every time I came back, I said, we have to have a universal house. Every small country in their cities, every great city yes. needs a university. Mm -hmm. Tertiary education was very important for me, and I thought it was very, very important, and I feel so good when I look back at, at, at the way in which um, I was able to have our government drive that process mm -hmm. to fulfillment. Excellent. I'm still talking about higher education and um, overseeing education in the country. NACOP was established under your administration and NACOP um, was established under the National Accreditation and Equivalency Act back in 2006, but it started to operate in 2016. What was the environment prior to the establishment of NACOP? Well, like everything else, uh, as a country tries to improve its educational system, one of the strategies you have to examine is the extent to which policies are at the discretion of the politician. Mm. The system prior to that act was that if, firstly, there was no standards, mm. um, there was no defining environment that you had to put in place for anyone applying for um, institution of higher learning, um, it just didn't exist. And so you recognize right away that there's something you have to do, yeah. okay? And you're talking about an institution and accreditation mm. where you have to be satisfied right, of the capacity of that institution to do the work that it is set out to do and to do it in a standard acceptable to the country. And so that is what we try to achieve and, and, yes. and moving forward to be able to put in place um, the credentials and, and, and um, the criteria and take away the discretion of the minister. You had a committee uh, who would receive the application. That committee would review the application, make a recommendation to the minister, and the minister decide on that. The act took all of that out and regularized it. And like everything else we did, all of the acts that are passed in pursuance of strengthening the educational system um, is to show and define, so you don't have to guess. I want you to expand on your administration's vision for financial aid for higher education. This is an area in government that I could feel proud of. We had a scholarship program that when we came to found in 2012, I think it was $7.75 million. By the time we finished our term, we had taken the scholarship program up to $18 million. We more than doubled that amount because we knew there was a need for students. Much more importantly though, we analyzed that when it came to the public and private schools, there was an incredibly um, difficult um, disparity there that 70% that, mm -hmm. that, um, of the school population was public school. But 90 plus percent, as much as 94%, maybe 96%, I think the figure is 96% of the money, scholarship money, was being allocated to the private schools. Because of the academic performance? Because of, that's right, all right? And we have to do something about that. But we knew that part of the process is yeah, qualifying people, improving the system, etc. But at the same time, we had to enable more fairness in the system. And so, Negotiations took place with American colleges. A decision was made to have the two categories, $10,000 $10, and 
$7,500 in terms of scholarship grants. And the effort was made then to create a greater balance. In about two years, we moved from 4% to 22%. Okay. In terms of public school access to scholarship grants. Okay. And the projection was that by 2020, 2021, there would be parity. It would be up to 50%. I don't know what it is now, but the objective was to be able to share that. And interestingly enough, I spoke at the commencement of um, graduation at C.B. Bethel School yesterday, mm -hmm. and I heard the principal of the school, of Mr. McCoy, bragging about how um, last year the school did 1.5 or so million in scholarships. This year is up to 2.5. A, a tremendous um, um, improvement, mm -hmm. and that meant that what we did was working. And, and I sat there again, you know, pat myself, say, Christy, <laughs> you do some things right. Very good. And so, so the, the point is, though, that education is always work in progress. Mm -hmm. um, a country cannot um, um, do wrong in spending more and more money on education. I always saw when I was spending money on education, I saw it as an investment and not an expense. When I looked back, by 2016, we came off in 2012, by 2016, he had completed all of the work we said we would do in our plan, the work that we, um, but, but we broadcast to the world and saying this is what we will do if we are elected. The concern I always had is that we lived in New Providence. You spoke about the pandemic. Yes. You spoke about the need for learning to take place during the pandemic. Yes. Bradley Roberts and Leon Williams came to me to say that we want to put fiber optic cables to certain islands that could pay for them. Exoma, Eleuthera, Bimini. I said, what would it cost to put fiber optic to Meguana and Ragged Island and Inagua. I said, because those kids have a right for the internet as well. And my government made a decision that, okay, we're gonna do it. But instead of spending 40 million, we're gonna spend 70 to 80 million dollars. I think it was more like 70, in mid 70 millions to put fiber optic cable around the Bahamas. Therefore, placing the Bahamas in a position where learning could take place from New Providence. We, we took the Learning Resources Institute and we put virtual learning, learning um, instruments in place. So when we left office in, in 2017, I think we had completed a process where from that institute, children could be educated around the Bahamas. So it's fair to say in your estimation that under your administration, you laid the foundation for what is now a virtual online education. There's no, well, you know, I don't know who else could claim it, but I think um, our government should feel very proud yes. of the contribution we made to educational development in the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. Well, thank you so much, sir. It is indeed a privilege to hear about all of the initiatives and programs that occurred during your time as our Prime Minister of this great country. You've been watching Ed Table Talk Unplugged. If you'd like to receive updates on what's happening at the Education Ministry, check out our website or other social media platforms. Well, that's all for now. I am Denise Pratt. Happy Independence, Bahamas.